rearranging the furniture when the house was burning down. You know, I mean, that, what she's saying, you can't just talk about identity politics. You have to talk about the context. You have to talk about capitalism. Another, I think, good turn is that another feminist, and this time she is an academician, Zila Eisenstein, and I was pleased to discover this because most, you know, most of feminist writings are really quite nothing more than mystification. I mean, they're wonderful. You know, they're, they're, you know wonderful in terms of the, you know, the, the vocabulary. I mean, they, you know, um, very sophisticated. Because what they're striving for is nuance and complexity. That, by the way, is the, what feminists are looking for. Nuance and complexity. That means you're really sophisticated when you do that. So, but Zila Eisenstein recently came out with a book titled Sexual Decoys, in which I was quite surprised because she had to turn liberal, you know, in one of her earlier books, but all of a sudden she comes out with this book that's really hitting hard at the U.S. war on Iraq. I mean, my God, and I thought, these are good things taking place. These are good things taking place. And that, you know, I mean, the conference I was asked to speak where we need to recuperate class. It's going to be a slow process because you've had a whole generation of students, you see, brainwashed in a kind of thinking without a critique, with no critique whatsoever. And I think it's special, especially critical for us in the Philippines. And that's why I, I kind of raised the questions. I have no answers. They really have to be questions for you. I kind of raised the question, what is the connection, if any, between feminist theorizing in the academy and activism? Because I know that people here are working in the field. Maybe not you know, those in the classroom, but there's work going on. I know that because I've talked to lots of people, all kinds of people who are doing organizing work. Maybe not as extensively as happened in the past, but there are people doing that. So I want to find out, is there a connection between the theory we're learning in the classroom and what's going on outside? Or are we just playing games in the classroom? I mean, that's fine too if we accept that, right? But I do know for a fact that in the United States there is no connection. Feminism is about Gaining credentials, you know, gaining credentials in the academy. On the other hand, I should also admit that of all the disciplines or fields in the academy, maybe women's studies and, and maybe ethnic studies are two of the most progressive because everything else is sterile. Maybe, of course, American studies, you know, and so on. But I really believe that for the most part, the claims to radicalism or, you know, progressive thinking, you know, they, they just have no basis, just have no basis, in fact, whatsoever. Um, again, just to repeat, um, and in, in a way, I'm kind of recounting history here with, with uh, Ida and, and with Lulu. It's a different world, you know, we're, we're living in today. So, you know, I mean, our thinking is, is, is very different from what it was in the 70s and 80s. And I'm wondering what we think of the theory that, or the perspectives we're reading coming from the United States. Do we just take it as our own? Do, do we, I mean, what use do we have? I mean, is, is it something that that is pertinent to our conditions? Do we even ask those questions? 
Is it something we take in order to establish credentials? Um, do the theories serve to shed light on reality? Or are we even concerned that they do or do not? I'm raising these questions because I, I really don't know what's going on. And I'm hoping that maybe you can respond to those questions before the end of this session. Thank you. but odd and as well uh, decided to actually write a paper <laughs> because I thought well it's there but you know having heard her today I, I think what they'll do is actually uh, not respond but add on or take another track or take the same track in terms of the ironies that she's mentioned um, but because I'm here in Ateneo I can't help but begin with saying that I've read nearly, I think, all the papers of Delia. And um, two days ago, I read all again the papers, just to be sure, because I was given the abstract. And I found that, you know, I, I won't, I won't uh, read what, what I wrote. But basically, if you have read nearly all or all the papers of Delia, you will see that it's all a critique. You know, critiquing status quo, or is, you know, current thinking, and pushing us the limits of the imagination and inquiry. And um, I, I, I said here that backgrounding these inquiries, you know, these questions that Delia has posed, not just today, but in the other, all the other papers and publications done, um, I can't help but think of Losada, of course. <laughs> you know, it's like Delia exposing, you know, the, the frailties, if you will, and the ironies of our times and the feminism, and we'll talk about that later. And also the Sada's expose in the Senate, and now of course the DOJ, the Ombudsman. Right? Backgrounding this, which I'm sure you don't know, or most of you wouldn't know, uh, are two, at least two. I can actually there are three, but I'll only mention two. So this is the expose, and Alvin was just saying a friend, Nagakakulu say you because the Sada is there, you know, with Jambi, uh, with all the College of Law student threats, no? God, you can imagine the traffic. Okay, um, so backgrounding this Losade to say and all this go with the group of the DOJ Ombudsman. There are actually ongoing deliberations of law and behold the Magna Carta of Women of the Philippines, which the essence of it is once it's passed, it becomes better and the touchstone of human rights of women. In other words, uh, this is the basis for the Convention and Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women the UN Convention, the Mother Convention on which uh, which the Philippines had signed many years ago and pinupush na siya ng UN na para kami yung legislative piece nito. Um, I've seen the draft, I've seen the latest draft and I'm not very happy about it but uh, GMA had said it is um, it is a uh, priority deal kasi makasinisigil na siya ng UN. Uh, <laughs> that because she thinks we should be given but, but you see, so, and this, as I said, I was said, telling to friends once this is passed with all its gaps and all its problems, I'm going to you know, touch tone of our karapatan, no? so I'm very worried. The other thing that's happening uh, is that uh, for those who are into law, you know, uh, our Article 202 of the Revised Penal Code as the anti -vag uh, the vagrancy law, no? Yung lahat ng makapakalat kalat dyan, no? Uh, so, in fact, this is being revised. And why I say this? Because uh, IT vagrancy law is not just about women in prostitution, but these are really about poor people. So, this is both about women and poor people. Um, 